Live from the John Hammond Street Digital Address, GA 0066714 for Adisawe, Kanda and Accra. This is News at 10 on TV3. We're also live on your DSTV channel 279 and streaming on Facebook Live as well as on 3news.com. I'm Stephen Anti. Welcome. Let's first take a look at the news, major news highlights of the day. Energy Minister John Peter Amewu has dismissed assertions that government failed in conducting due diligence in the PDS concession agreement. Speaking to TV3 in an exclusive interview, the sector minister rubbish calls for him to resign, adding that government should rather be commended for safeguarding national assets. And the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASAP, is calling for the immediate interdiction of officials of media to prevent them from tampering with evidence. At a media briefing in Accra, ASAP urged government to stop taking any advice from IFC as a financial consultant. Government has meanwhile frozen the accounts of PDS. And still tonight, Parliament has approved a 6.3 billion CDs. The Finance Minister is requesting in its mid-year review for its physical policies. Uh, after a fierce debate between the majority and the minority side, Parliament eventually uh, approved uh, this, this, by majority decision, approved the budget. And the Accra High Court hearing the trial of Boko Central MP Mahama Yariga has put the case on hold. This is to await the determination of the legitimacy of Martin Amidu to hold the office of special prosecutor by the Supreme Court. The Boko Central MP Mahama Yariga has put the case on hold. All right, so those were the major news highlights on the making rounds on the local front. Let's see what's happening on the international front. And let's go straight to Congo, where a second person has died of Ebola on uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo's border with Rwanda, raising fears a deadly illness could spread. The artisanal miner died on Wednesday morning in the city of Goma home to 2 million people. More than 1,600 people have died of Ebola in the DR Congo since the outbreak began in August of 2018. But those have been in more remote areas. So those were the news making round on the international front. I'm Stephen Enti. This is uh, news at 10 live from the news hub at Addisawe Kanda in Accra. Up next is a big one. Welcome back. Now, the Africa Center for Energy Policy, ASAP, is calling for the immediate interdiction of officials of MEDA to the Millennium Development Authority to prevent them from tampering with evidence. At a media briefing in Accra, ASAP urged government to stop taking any advice from IFC as a financial consultant. Government has meanwhile frozen their accounts of PDS. Preliminary information available to ASAP shows that insurance provided by PDS has been declared fraudulent by the Qatar-based Akut Insurance. While the situation is under investigation by the government of Ghana, ASA believes that the contested document could have been deemed suspicious if MIDA and the transaction advisors, which is IFC, had shown the slightest seriousness and place Ghana first. The requirement of bad guarantees prescribed under the concession agreement was changed to insurance bond to fit the weak capacity of the concessionaire to raise the needed bank guarantee. This was in breach of the requirement approved by Parliament of Ghana. While the bank guarantee can be called upon without recourse, the same cannot be said about insurance bond. The insurance bond of $350 million produced by PDS was signed by only the managing director 
of the issuer. It has emerged that the MD's signature was forged. Persistent caution, number three, by ECG on the weaknesses of the bond issued was ignored. Perhaps ECG was seen to be a detractor uh, of the concession process and not a relevant party interested in properly scrutinizing the assets, securitizing the assets of the company. Eventually, it was this same ECG that managed to unravel the alleged misrepresentation or fraud. There is a need for immediate interdiction of the leadership of MIDA to prevent tampering with evidence that may, ne that may be necessary to support the case of the state. Government should seize with immediate effect the consumption of advice from IFC on the transaction. This is because the IFC has proven incapable of defending the interests of its clients, in this case, Ghana government and MIDA. Government should immediately audit the background of the beneficial owners of the local partners in the PDS uh, 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 consortium. Let's get onto the telephone lines to speak with uh, Pauline Anaman. Uh, she is the head of policy, uh, the head of re policy unit at the ASAP. Uh, good evening, ma'am, and thank you very much. So I need you to explain to us how the issue of guarantee works in this situation and when it comes to the PDS concession agreement. Hello? Yeah, can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, um, I lost you at some point. Right, so I'm asking you if you could explain to us how the issue of guarantee works in this particular situation of PDS concession agreement. Oh, okay, okay. So good evening to you and your viewers. Uh, so um, when it comes to an agreement such as the one we have, government of Ghana has with PDS, it is one that is worth about four billion dollars. Okay, and this kind of agreement involves leasing of um, ECG's assets, and that also the agreement also involves PDS required to invest about more than five hundred million dollars in the first five years. So um, there is the requirement for a guarantee because um, that guarantee is supposed to serve as a buffer to government in case. PDS defaults on its payments of, um, uh, let's say, fees, for want of better words, to ECG for leasing ECG's assets. And also, uh, you know, for investment requirements with, for the first five years. So this, uh, this um, um, uh, how do you call it, this guarantee is fundamental to the whole agreement because without it, I mean, we cannot move on with whatever we intend or purport to do with PDS involvement in the power distribution sector. Mm. Now, I know that ASAP is calling for uh, what you call interdiction of officials of MIDA uh, to prevent them from tampering with evidence. I mean, who in the structure of MIDA, for example, could be interdicted and could be prosecuted? So, you know, P uh, MIDA is uh, under the presidency uh, of the, gov I mean, the, the government of Ghana, and MIDA was put together to administer or was established to administer the entire processes. So every person in charge of the processes uh, with regard to the award of the contract must be held responsible at this point and must be asked to step aside mm -hmm. for investigations to go on because what we don't want is for people with enough information, people like those involved in the direct um, award of the contracts who have access to very relevant information. Uh, what we don't want is for such people to still be exposed because they can influence a lot of things. They can influence how information flows. So such people, whoever they may be, must be, must be asked to step aside their post. Mm. Uh, that's what we are asking for. So are you, yeah. are you referring to, for example, those who appended signatures, who signed the document in contention here? Precisely so, yes, precisely so. So every person involved from the start with the contracting process, right from shortlisting through to, you know, um, disqualifying people, 
um, companies and then settling on the decision to award a contract to PDS, contrary to the requirement that PDS is supposed to present a bank guarantee, must be held responsible. And all these people would definitely have their details on record. So the government must make reference to these records. And, and these are public records. Mm, so I know that way. These records and I agree that holding uh, persons accountable for this mess is crucial. But let's look at it this way. If PDS wanted to do uh, due diligence but were deceived, more like misled by the issuer, then what really can PDS do or could have done? No, so if PDS is dealing with a country, a whole entity, a country like Ghana, then it is also on their part, it's the requirements on their part to ensure that they bring in a credible guarantees. And so the burden of proof really lies on PDS to ensure, to, to prove that whatever document they have presented was not fake. Mm. So, you know, when you are dealing with an entity and you present a document, you are presumed to draw the validity or otherwise of that document. Mm. So whether or not you have uh, you have done your due diligence, it's immaterial over here. You are presenting a valid document for a contract, and so as a party to the contract, you must ensure that what you are presenting is something you believe in. So if PDS... I, I, I don't see where the argument lies for PDS to argue that they believe the document was valid. That is none of our business. Interesting. Now, legally, I want to find out from you whether you think legally uh, government is insulated from uh, anything looking at the action that it has taken. And can this lead to us uh, incurring judgment debt? Yeah, so um, from the discussions we have had today, from the analysis we have done, we see that the step government has taken this set to suspend the agreement is in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And that is within government's right. That is within government's remit as a party to a contract. Because according to the basic principles of contract, contracting must be done in good faith by the two parties. And where one party discovers that the other party has fraudulently misrepresented valuable information that goes to the fundamentals of the contract, then the innocent party has the right to set the contract aside. So that is what the government has done in this case. So, you know, government went into this agreement believing that the documents presented by PDS was actually valid and true. And PDS, nobody knows whether or not they knew that the documents were fake. That is none of anybody's business. It is up to them to prove Right. So right now, the action taken by government is in the right order. And what we expect from the next step is for government to uh, investigate to the letter of the issue. And when it is established that indeed the document was fraudulent, then it is within the, part, it is within the right of the party to decide whether or not they want to take the issue to court. Right. And then everything that happens thereafter is within the competence of, uh, 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 I mean, it's within the jurisdiction of the court of competent jurisdiction in Ghana. So, you know, um, issues about cancelling the contract, as I mentioned, is within the rights of government. And when it comes to issues of judgment, that, that is really within the jurisdiction of the court to decide. Right. Uh, Madam uh, Anaman, we're grateful for your time. Pauline Anaman is head of uh, policy unit at the African Center for Energy Policy, ASAP. Now, still on this, the Energy Minister, John Peter Mew, has dismissed assertions that government failed in conducting due diligence in the PDS concession agreement. Speaking to TV3 in an exclusive interview, the sector minister rubbished calls for him to resign, adding that government should rather be commended for safeguarding a national asset. The sector minister, John Peter Amewu, will justify the decision by government to suspend the deal. The decision to suspend the, uh, the conception agreement between uh, ECG and the PDS is as a result of some um, uh, material evidence that seems to conclude that uh, the payment security 
which ought to have come from uh, PDS, uh, was not well executed and therefore being considered as uh, fraudulently uh, done. And on that basis, um, government think it's important to quickly uh, hold on the assets of Ghanaians because don't forget this is a major asset that we have transferred and if such a fraudulent uh, activities have been uh, detected uh, its proper government takes on action. Some Ghanaians including the opposition have questioned the manner in which PDS was awarded the contract imputing lack of due diligence. Uh, don't forget their condition subsequent and condition precedent to this contract and so the due diligence process is an ongoing process and that is where we have been able to establish uh, this element of uh, fraud of course which is yet to be validated uh, but wise we wait for the uh, uh, the validation process government have taken this action to secure the assets. On what the ramifications of such an action could be, the minister outlined three scenarios. The letter uh, which is coming from the Akut uh, claiming that the uh, payment security is fraudulently uh, done and that they have nothing to do, to do with it and the officer responsible for that had already been suspended and therefore they are taking the issue seriously. If that decisions have been concluded, then of course uh, that automatically will lead to a termination of uh, the construction. That is number one. Uh, uh, number two is that if government take a decision to terminate without validation, there may be some consequences, and that is why government do not take that second option. Now the third option is uh, if. Uh, it has been found out that, of course, the uh, payment guarantee of the security had been well executed and al Kut, which is an executing company, uh, had accepted responsibility for it and there have been some element of consideration. Then, of course, the process will, will continue. Consequently, the Energy Commission has appointed the ECG as interim operator to take charge of management and operations of electricity sale. The demand guarantees submitted by PDS to ECG have been disavowed by the issuer and declared null and void. The consequent impairment of the lease and assignment agreement between ECG and PDS, the decision by ECG to suspend the provisions of rights and obligations defined under the LAA, pending determination of all consequential matters arising out of the above. As a result, PDS is to facilitate and provide ECG with the needed access to all billing systems, metering operations, payment accounts involved in the operation of the retail sales license. Key officers of both PDS and ECG have been invited to a meeting at the Energy Commission tomorrow at 10 a.m. to resolve any outstanding issues relating to the appointment of ECG as interim operator. You're still watching News at 10 live from our studios at Tadisawe Kanda in Accra. We're right back with more news. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, a group calling itself Agenda for Development in the Hohoi constituency is advocating improved livelihoods and development for indigents of the locality. Addressing the media at a forum today, leader of the group, George Dogbe, said one of the surest ways of attracting investment and development uh, in the region is for the people to elect a visionary leader in the Energy uh, Minister, John Peter Mewo, to represent them in Parliament come 2020. The Hawaii seat has traditionally been held by the National Democratic Congress, despite several attempts by the new patriotic party to annex it. In 2004 and 2008, now Energy Minister John Peter Mewu, who was the then District Chief Executive for the Hawaii North constituency, contested on the ticket of the NPP, but was twice unsuccessful. However, with just a few months to the 2020 parliamentary and presidential elections, many interest groups have emerged to throw their weight behind the Energy Minister. The agenda for developments made up of market women, taxi drivers, artisans and farmers from five traditional areas in the constituency say they believe John Pitamewu is the right man to lead them to prosperity. George Dogbe is leader of the group. Over the last 12 months, Agenda for Development Hawaii constituency has been on the ground, testing the pulse of the masses and objectively assessing the chances of Honorable John Pitamewu 
for the Hopper parliamentary seat. As President J.F. Kennedy once said, quote, I am old enough to know and young enough to do, unquote. We believe Honorable J.P. Amau is old enough to know and understand the problems and challenges of our constituency, and young enough to do the dearly needed developmental projects. The minister is, however, yet to declare his intentions to contest the seat, but there are clear indications he may do so anytime soon. And roads leading to the University of Professional Studies in Accra, UPSA, and immediate surroundings have been awarded on contract for the erection of street lights. The project is aimed at improving security for students in and around the campus. A total of 657 students graduated from the fourth session of the 11th Congregation of the University of Professional Studies. This is the first time the school is holding four sessions. To ensure the smooth implementation for the new system, the school put together a blueprint which consists of the various departments in the university and the date for their congregation. Deputy Minister for Education Kojo Yanka explained the ongoing audit service at the tertiary level is not targeted at universities. An audit process has been underway in the past few months meant to ensure institutional compliance with quality assurance processes. This step, unfortunately, has been misinterpreted as an attempt to downsize as well as embarrass and demote faculty. Some foreign missions, indeed, have even protested to our office, protesting attempts on our part to ridicule degrees obtained from their countries. I would like to assure one and all that the audit process is a normal exercise in taken worldwide to correct slippages in the system and are not targeted at any particular local or foreign university or countries. Vice Chancellor Professor Benego Fehi Oko Amate said the huge investment made in infrastructural and human development over the past few years was geared towards improving the delivery of quality academic service. Some 18 students were presented certificates in Master of Philosophy in Leadership, 632 in Master of Business Administration, and 7 in Master of Science Leadership. And the Minister for Local Government and Rural Development, Hajia Ali Mahama, has expressed disappointment over some disagreements which blocked the amendment of Article 243, Clause 1 of the Constitution, which gives power to the President to appoint Metropolitan, Municipal and District Chief Executives. The Secretary Minister noted that prioritizing the referendum to amend Article 55, Clause 3 of the Constitution is inconsequential uh, since it would not affect the roadmap to electing MMDCEs. Election of Metropolitan, Municipal and District Chief Executives has received a massive endorsement from a cross-section of the Ghanaian public. An Afrobarometer report released in February 2018 revealed that 69% of Ghanaians agree or agree strongly that their Metropolitan, Municipal and District Chief Executives be elected. The Bill for Amendment of Article 553 of the Constitution has been gazetted to pave way in May, the, the government announced the roadmap on election of, of MMDCs. It was evident certain entrenched provisions in the constitution like Article 55 Clause 3 will have to be amended through a referendum, whilst Article 243 Clause 1, which gives appointing authority to the president, be amended by parliament. But on Monday, July 29, Parliament could not reach a consensus on amending Article 243. Speaker, we need to appreciate two dimensions. One, the history of decentralization in Ghana is one that can be traced to 1988 GNDC Law 207. At the time that it was established, there, was, there were no political parties in Ghana. The minority argued that the people's power of amending Article 55 Clause 3 should be prioritized before any other relevant provision is touched. We on this side, and I want to refer our colleagues, even though you have significant majority, 
you do not have the numbers constitutionally required without the cooperation and support of the minority. The inconclusive debate demanded that amending Article 243 be deferred to a later date. And that's how we wrap up on news at 10. Thank you very much for making time. And we have the crew. Good night. There's more news at 3news.com.